Good morning. Good morning. I love talking on the second day of BSD conferences, the first thing in the morning, because it is the only place you can get this kind of privacy. <laughs> I also need to thank Mr. Dexter for arranging Coke Zero. My talk is saved. So, yeah, well, welcome everyone, all of you fine, fine people, and Benedict. What? Um, <laughs> so, uh, why, why, why am I the one up here? Well, uh, basically because Dexter said, we want you at Meet BSD. I have a club in one hand and gelato in the other. Which would you like? So here I am. Um, uh, my talks often run over. I've tried really hard to get this under the limit. Um, the rehearsal went okay, but I, I put the stuff I can rush through at the end. I'll be talking mostly open BSD and free BSD here. Uh, th those are the communities I'm most familiar with. I'm not trying to run down any other open any other BSD community. And part of this is based on my recollections, part is talking to people, uh, part is searching through the mailing list archives and finding some real treasures. Um, now I'm not a committer with any group. A lot of the time I'll say we because I, I do identify with the BSD community. But what I really mean is you. <laughs> Because you, you are the ones who do the work. So, wh why BSD? Um, I mean, BSD is royal blood Unix. We are the nobility of operating systems. Some people would say that makes us kind of vestigial, like, you know, the, the British royal family and whatnot. Um, and, but it is way cool. And, but the truth is, cool is a terrible way to run your career. Um, my life might have been easier if I'd become a Windows expert, if I'd gone with Linux. Um, I, I would make more money if I wrote Microsoft or Linux books, or if, if I wanted real money, I could suck up to Oracle. Uh, and, and the answer really can't be as simple as all of my friends are here. I mean, you, 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 those of you who are really my friends would stay my friends even if I, you know, signed on with, with one of the unspeakable evil entities out there. So, um, I started with FreeBSD in 95 because it let me sleep. I got paged every time a server went down, uh, Unixware died, Windows died, uh, we had a, a very nice Solaris box, but we didn't have one professional admin. We had 30 amateur sysadmins, so that didn't hold together well. Um, FreeBSD let me sleep, uh, I, so I picked it up and ran with it. I picked up OpenBSD uh, uh, a couple years later. I mean, and I, I, as I climbed the corporate ladder, I dragged BSD with me. I used dummy net to simulate a transatlantic connection in the developer's office uh, of a, a global firm so that he could experience what users in Germany experienced with his web pages without flying him across the country. Uh, more than once I've used OpenBSD in front of a commercial firewall. I'm, I'm not going to name names here because that would be rude. Um, but I've, I've had to protect commercial firewalls by putting an OpenBSD cluster in front of them because they really desperately needed uh, some kind of traffic checkpoint. So, uh, my last job though was a little different. I, I didn't know it was my last real job. Uh, it was at an ISP and, and the boss was a geek's geek. He, he understood tech down to the silicon and he stayed up on the open source gossip. And we all know that there's always a new OS or a new distribution or a new something that promised us to solve all the problems. And he tried them all. And, and the only way to really try something is to try it in production on a vital system that you won't later be able to take down. So uh, when I came in, 
I got exposed to dozens of operating systems. Uh, he had basically installed one of everything. There's you know, some BSD, CentOS-based, Debian-based, Slackware-ish, Solaris, Open Solaris, and you know, the cool flavor of the month from the last 100 months. So, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, no AIX, no HPUKES. Um, the billing system ran on Linux on Itanium because the pre-compiled exploits wouldn't work on that host. <laughs> um, which, which is a fair point. Um, everything was basically stable in this sort of ramshackle. We're using the help desk for monitoring way. Uh, and it was my job to corral this. Uh, there was no virtualization. This was 2010. Uh, there were no remote consoles. Uh, there was a clean and elegant design to this network, but it was buried under two decades of temporary fixes and let's roll this out and we have to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm not picking on him. I adored that boss, best boss I've ever had. And we have all been there, but you know, it was my job to untangle and modernize all of this. And I looked at this and said, you know, this is an opportunity. I've been using BSDs now for over a decade. I picked them up for a really good reason, but time has passed. It, it, should I look at where I am? You know, I, I took a, a hard look in the mirror, which, you know, is not easy with this face, and said, okay, I'm going to give everything here a serious try. I'm going to use the docs. I'm not going to just blindly rip it out and slap BSD anywhere. I'll learn some things. Maybe there is something better out there. Keep an open mind. Be fair. And I got everything modernized and cleaned up about a week before the company got sucked up by another firm and destroyed. So after all of this, after looking hard at everything, I stayed with BSD. And, and the reasons why have, have a lot of time behind them. Uh, years and decades know things that days and weeks simply can't. And, and to find out why I stayed, we, we really have to look back. Um, I went looking for the first post on FreeBSD hackers, but the mailing lists were trimmed to 1994, so I, I went with some release notes. And let, let's look at what we've got here. I mean, Greek letters for uh, release candidates, I mean, that, that's very geeky. Now we go with these silly numbered Alpha 6 and Beta 12 and what have you. No, no, they, they, they had the right idea then. I mean, a dynamic buffer cache, this was an amazing invention. Um, and now it's just, th this is how it's done. Uh, we imp FreeBSD imported the Linux sound drivers. Um, yay. And re remember when CD-ROMs came in a variety of interfaces and all needed different APIs and install floppies? Um, it doesn't make sense, but I would still swear that an install floppy could only be used five or six times before you had to throw it out. Uh, an X free 86 2. Be, be still my beating heart. And, and open BSD in the beginning. Uh, I grabbed this from the very first slideshow. Uh, think back, remember Telnet? If you wanted SSH, you had to do this song and dance to get the libraries. Uh, the, the idea of securing DNS and NFS and these other insecure protocols wa was absurd because we're, we're never going to secure these things. They're terrible. And, and buffer overflows. Rem remember when that was security? I miss those days. Uh, you, you fixed all the buffer overflows and didn't do anything stupid and you were secure. And you know, stealing BSD code, I mean, it, isn't that what we're here for, is to steal from each other? So, and I, I don't want people to think I'm, I'm picking on the early days. Uh, 
because back in the 90s, none of us had any idea what we were getting into. Um, this is from 1997, and it's my earliest message I could find on the mailing list. Uh, I know I sent earlier messages, but I suspect I used a pseudonym earlier, which uh, was astonishingly prescient on my part. Um, the answer to this question was in the FAQ. Despite that, Doug White was a saint and answered it. Uh, I understand he went off to work in his family's hardware store, for which I really can't blame him, but uh, none of us had any idea what we were getting into. And if we knew, I suspect we, we would have gone to work in a hardware store. So, you know, forks. BSD is about forks. You know, 4.4 begat the 386 BSD uh, patch kit, which begat NetBSD and FreeBSD. NetBSD begat OpenBSD. A few people have forked that, but none have really prospered. FreeBSD has begat Dragonfly and Hardened and TrueOS and, and lots of things. Um, and, and the thing here is, all, all of these start with, with one or two people that have a vision. You know, people like Dylan and Theo have, have this idea that they could implement and articulate. And, and I, I don't sign on to the great man view of history, but someone has to get the ball rolling and inspire others and move them on. And each of these forks and descendants keeps the best of where they come from. And, and truthfully, success and failure of a fork doesn't exactly matter. A negative result is a result. And, and all of this comes, is built on the fact that BSD systems are self-hosting and self-building. I'll, I'll talk more on that in a bit, but it is utterly vital to why I'm staying. And we all face the same problems and we take different uh, approaches. How many people here went through an A out to ELF migration? Most of you are very lucky people. Um, for FreeBSD to migrate an installed system from A out to ELF, there was complicated instructions, and you had to do this little dance, and you prayed that you did it exactly right, because if you didn't, you reinstalled. The OpenBSD folks said, here's an ELF snapshot, upgrade from binary, suck it. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with the OpenBSD folks on that, having done the FreeBSD build uh, and reinstalled. You know, the packaging tools, OpenBSD rewrote all the ports tools in Perl. FreeBSD ripped Perl out of the base system. Uh, and ports, we, we've all got variations on the port system, but after exploring the rest of the, the software ecosystem out there, our, our port system in any variant is a miracle. Repeatable, customizable build of add-on software. Um, have you ever tried to install packages on a 10-year-old Solaris system? Or find packages for Red Hat 6, not, not the modern Red Hat 6, the one from the 90s before they started over in their numbering. Uh, no, no, ports is magic and we, we've all modified the system in different ways, but uh, still. And I, I want to talk a bit on release engineering because really in, in open source, the release is the product. Um, BSD release engineers get final say on what happens. Uh, it's not a, a technical review board. It's more of a, no, no, we're not releasing until you fix this, or we are releasing, fix it, or deal with it. Um, <clears throat> Theo does open BSD. There's a whole team on FreeBSD. And, and there are downsides, you know, OpenBSD is time-based. 
FreeBSD, not exactly. And th th there, are, there are downsides to both. The OpenBSD folks, you, you sometimes get source code for stuff that's not hooked up to the build yet because it doesn't work. I mean, is, is this a preview? Is it a promise? Is it an empty promise? You, you don't know. They avoid some problems because they have the shorter end of life and they control so many components like LibreSSL. Uh, and the, the date-based releases make things utterly boring and predictable. I, I schedule my OpenBSD upgrades on the calendar a year in advance. Um, FreeBSD d does things differently. Jordan specifically asked me not to talk about what happened with FreeBSD 215, so I'm not going to say a word about it. Um, but FreeBSD has had uh, a, a long and painful learning curve on release engineering. It's not released when it's done because that is an absolute recipe for disaster. Um, it's kind of a dance between time and feature. And, and FreeBSD, I really believe we owe people like Jordan and Paul Henning Camp uh, a lot of thanks for figuring out the initial heavy lifting. Um, I mean, make release is another miracle. And you know, then there we we have we've had rough times like 5.0, where RE had to do some really hard pushing just to make a release happen because 5.0 was so ambitious that if RE hadn't pushed, there wouldn't we would still be running 5.0 current. Uh, and and right now we we've, we've got a lot of drama. Where did my mouse go? There's the mouse. We've got a lot of drama right now on 12.0. Um, at the time the release was scheduled, there was no long-term support version of OpenSSL. And they announced one shortly after the freeze began. So do you live with the currently running OpenSSL and suck up the pain for the next five years? Do you put in the new OpenSSL and make right now really painful, but stretch it on out? And whatever you do, nobody is going to be truly happy. Um, but RE is the one that takes that on the chin. And right now, they, they've elected to merge and delay. And I understand that the, the actual beta builds came out today-ish. Or are being built today, so we're, we're we are we are squeezing our way through this pain and drama right now, and um, you know a, a time-based release that's supported for five years wouldn't really be in the interest of the project. Um, and and the nice thing is that the the FreeBSD folks retain tribal knowledge. Uh, you know, Paul Henning Camp and Scott Long are still hanging around here, uh, despite people's best efforts to scare them off. And, you know, Rod Grimes, are you? Um, he was, th this poor fool did some of the earliest releases and came back onto RE, which the, the, the man either needs you to buy him a drink or, you know, psychiatric medication, but perhaps both. So, and it, it's not bound by the past, the, the RE is, is modifying the process. If you really want to get into the, the, the realities of FreeBSD, sign up for the RE team. Um, and it's not that I'm going to say that all problems come back, but looking at this, uh, I hear that the 12.0 release first CD just overflowed. Some problems stay around a long time. <laughs> so a another thing that's kept me is what's really included. And, and we, we talk about how BSDs are complete operating systems, but other operating systems bill are built out of packages. Some of those packages are collected from who knows where, and they're built on a developer's desktop. In uh, you, you can you can get this 
single cohesiveness from a commercial OS, but BSDs take responsibility for what they ship. Yes, maybe it's an upstream bug, maybe something in contrib has, has, has failed, but BSD folks take responsibility for what they call their product. And that you don't get shuffled off to some package builder in who knows where that stopped answering email because they realized they screwed up and some big distribution included the package. Uh, and, and another important thing is the, the self-hosting part. You, you can take any BSD operating system, make changes, and build the whole OS yourself with what ships with the operating system. You don't have to hunt for directions that may or may not be correct. You don't need to wander around collecting who knows what, like you're playing a, a you know, Legend of Zelda video game, getting tokens to open the next door. No, it's you go into user source, you, you look at an FAQ, and you run some commands and that's it. Which means forking is easy. Um, I have had a few brilliant ideas about various BSD operating systems and wouldn't it be cool if we just did this? And it's very easy to, for me to prove to myself that my brilliant idea is a crock of steaming poo. Because I can prove that. And in, in just, I make my changes, uh, I run make release, and wow, everything is terrible. And, and, you know, pain is the best teacher, but no one wants to go to a school. BSD makes admission to that school so easy. And, and we can answer questions ourselves. Building your own Linux, in comparison, is uh, a, quite a challenge. And debugging. Debugging BSD is easy. I'm, I'm a terrible, terrible programmer. Uh, that's why I write. So, but kernel panic, pretty much any BSD, no problem. I look at the instructions, boom, here is a dump. I ship it off. Getting someone to look at that dump can be a, a, a separate problem, but uh, it's no worse than dealing with commercial tech support where they're supposedly paid to listen to you. So, and, and finally the documentation. The fact that the official docs exist inside the project. If, if I want OpenBSD docs, I go to openbsd.org and that is the answer. If I want free BSD docs, yes, there are forums and there are, uh, you know, there is a wiki, and there's a handbook in the FAQ, but it's all in one domain, and I know that's fairly official. Or, you know, the wiki may be obsolete, but these are solid points to start with. I don't go, I don't have to wander through some third-party site uh, and pray that this particular set of forums happens to have attracted a crowd of competent users of this OS. And that the answer I get is, well, no, is close enough that I will be able to fumble my way through it, which is, which is absolutely terrible. So, now, in all fairness, BSD is not perfect. Uh, the f various folks have been working on GPL-free systems, and I, I kind of think this is like Zeno's paradox. Every year we cut the GPL that remains in the base in half, and we never quite get there, but it's, it's not a failure, but it's certainly not a success yet. Um, but the truth is we, can't, we cannot predict what's going to fail and what's going to succeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, truth is my best-selling books are my most ludicrous. Uh, so you might as well be ambitious. Uh, OpenBSD's PCC. A beautiful idea, didn't work. Uh, very hard thing to do. Uh, LibKSE, anyone remember that? 
M to N threads. Well, yes, yes. Uh, I think I saw you flinch there. <laughs> but what was in 5.0 ripped out in like 7.0. But ridiculously ambitious. It was hard to program on the OS side, but if, if they'd succeeded, it would be beautiful. It was also hard for developers to program applications in, though. So since nobody could use it correctly, well, let's move on. Uh, SysTrace, not exactly a failure on OpenBSD's part, but it didn't work the way they thought. It turned out to have some problems, but I, I would certainly argue that experience with SysTrace, that failure, colored and helped the Unveil and Pledge API. Because I, I, there's nothing as compelling as, as experience uh, in, in learning what to do and what not to do. And, and GRAID 5 never quite cleaned up enough to get into FreeBSD. But we've had some really good successes too. Um, NetBSD. I, I like NetBSD. They're, they're kind of silent but deadly. Uh, they, no publicity there. And, and frankly, if, if NetBSD decides to change and become a guild of assassins, we will never know we're dead. Uh, but you know, Lua in the kernel, may, yes, you can abuse this horribly to put you know, web servers and IRC servers in the kernel, because why wouldn't you? But it also makes prototyping really easy. Uh, rump kernels, I've never needed one. Uh, but if you need one, you really need one, there it is. Uh, package source. I adore package source. In, in my efforts to learn and understand all these OSs and get packages, uh, native packages from the OS vendors for those releases, um, uh, about half the time I wound up falling back to package source because package source made it possible and the, the OS was you know, in some way unmaintained. And if you need to get a modern SNMP agent on a 15-year-old Solaris box, package source is your friend. I, I've saved companies millions, literally, using package source. And blacklist D. Uh, I hate log parsers. They, there are programs like uh, Fail to Ban and a whole family of these uh, that read log files and pluck out ba uh, bad actors on the internet and feed them to the firewall. And the reason there are whole bunches of these is because they're all terrible. They're, they're better than nothing, but they're, they're really solving the wrong problem. Now, the advantage of a log parser is you can write it in Perl or Python and whatever, and you don't have to modify the original source. But programs can identify bad actors on the internet. That's why they make the log entries. And Blacklisty allows a program to just directly tell the firewall, you know, this guy is misbehaving. And Blacklisty keeps a count of that and says, okay, after, you know, this host tried to break into our SSH server three times, ban them. I, I really want to see OpenSSH do something like that because OpenSSH is everywhere and once they adopt a, a blacklisty like tool or blacklisty itself, that will become standard and it will be available everywhere. I want, as an admin, I want the ability to say, if someone fails to authenticate three times on any service I offer, firewall them. And, and that is solving the right problem. OpenBSD has some lovely successes too. Um, they're, they're pretty choosy on what they take on. Uh, OpenSSH rules the internet, uh, wh which is actually a problem because monocultures are deadly. Uh, you know, LibreSSL, I, I remember Bob Beck saying, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do this. Oh, crap, we have to do this. Crap is not the word he used. Um, functions like Sterlcopy and Sterlcat 
Uh, no, they're not perfect, but uh, they help a lot. And they're still not in GNU libc because you know, we all know that handling your chainsaw perfectly is far preferable to installing finger guards over the blades. And, and PF is, is still the most ridiculously readable firewall config. FreeBSD has a bunch of successes. The OpenZFS integration is wonderful. Uh, SMP, the fine-grained locking, it's an ongoing project and it's, it's really paying off. Pudria is another miracle. The ability to just, after hunting through clouds, do that, that's a bad word in this audience, never mind. After hunting through random websites looking for packages that run on a, a particular variant of a particular operating system. Uh, Poudriere is a breath of fresh air. You can just build your packages exactly the way you want, even for older releases. And it just works. This is genius. Uh, jails. Uh, I've encountered a bunch of FreeBSD 4 and 5 and 6 boxes that, you know, they're, they're on old cruddy hardware and you can just pick those up and move those in a jail and get rid of, of a lot of the problems. I mean, you're still running that custom app written in PHP 2 and MySQL 3 with a version of OpenSSL from 2003, but you can use a lot of things on the host to help mitigate that. And, and FreeBSD is running a, a, doing a really good job of running straight into the, the enterprise gap left by uh, Solaris. And really, what, what pulls us all together is the BSD license. Okay, I have a few minutes. Um, and really, this comes down to our academic heritage. The BSD folks are writing code for the betterment of mankind. Uh, anyone can use this for anything and, and why this is relevant is it's defining a, a minimal acceptable level of code. Can you do better? If not, then don't try. Um, back in the 90s, I knew a bunch of people who were upset that, that Microsoft stole the, the BSD TCP IP stack. And, and my answer to that is really, did you use Windows 95? <laughs> Can you imagine the cost in human suffering if Microsoft had written their own IP stack? <laughs> Think about this for a minute. Um, Can you write a better file system than UFS? Yes, lots of people have, have complaints on UFS, but you know what? Uh, it's pretty damn solid and poor Kirk has been fixing obscure, smaller and smaller edge case bugs in UFS for, you know, longer than I've been a Unix admin. So, it, it, it's pretty solid. So, if you can't, this is a minimum acceptable level of code. And, and some people will complain that, no, you can close off the code. Um, you know, uh, Dashiell Hammett was once asked, how do, you how do you feel about Hollywood ruining your books like the Maltese Falcon? And he said, they didn't ruin my books. My books are still on the shelf. Right there, you, you go read it. Um, critical infra internet infrastructure for so many years had BSD style licenses. Um, if you box it up and sell it as is, you're, you're not going to do well. Anyone who innovates can beat you. You have to add something. Uh, and frankly, outside of, here, uh, outside of here in Silicon Valley, most organizations have trouble finding people who can make reports from their access databases, let alone modifying a kernel. Um, and, and let's say you try, you lock off the course, or you lock off the source, and, and you're going to uh, make it your own thing. You're, you're going to completely separate from the BSD community. What really happens? Well, there's a, a distinct life cycle. 
here, where someone will build... A, now, I've seen this in many companies. If you think I'm talking about your company or a place where you worked, I probably am. But I'm also talking about a bunch of other companies who have done exactly this. So, uh, someone will build a product, say, built based on FreeBSD 4. Um, the hardware advances, they have to update. And they have this massive patch set and this, this divergence of code makes some parts applicable because FreeBSD solves problems some other way that, than your organization. So, you'll show up at Meet BSD or BSD Can or wherever and you'll send a couple engineers and say, we're going to engage with the community, we're going to stay synced with your, with your code, uh, we are going to engage with you, and then we don't hear anything from them. So, eventually they need to update to a newer release again, the cycle repeats, and the company is eventually dragged under, possibly by technical debt, possibly by you know, simple incompetence. But what I have seen more and more of is a successful engagement with communities, uh, both for, for both FreeBSD and OpenBSD. You start off by hiring folks who get their patches committed. You know, even if you can only hire one. Uh, define what it is your company does that is special that you want to hang on to. Um, and everything else you upstream. A ha a hand the, you, know, you discover a new panic that nobody else has ever hit that isn't relevant to, to your special stuff that you do. Hand that back to the community. Because remember, every diff is technical debt. Um, and it's, it's not really much worse than maintaining your own repo. And, and that person that you hired, have them groom other techs in your company to get their patches committed as well. Get rid of that single point of failure. Um, and the really cool ones sponsor BSD events and have parties in the evening. So, uh, and, and you know, have an open bar and lots of good food. Um, the truly cool ones have gelato. <laughs> so, uh, yes, your company will probably still get dragged under by the forces of nature because that's what companies do, but it won't be technical debt that drags you under. So, our culture. We, we have a lot, there are arguments between branches of the BSDs and the, and the truth is we have a lot more in common than we don't. Uh, I deliberately try to stand between the communities, uh, kind of inside and outside. They all have a different model, and, and each community has the, their expectations for behavior and different methods of dealing with problems, and really, leadership sets the standards for behavior, not just one individual, but a, a, a group of leaders. Um, and, and I've observed the BSDs really sort by personalities and communication styles and problem solving styles. If you get along inside one BSD but not inside another, that, that's just how your personality is wired and it's okay. Now, I, I'm not saying it's okay to be a complete jerk, but we, we all have groups we fit with better. You know, if you, if you sign on with Theo, with OpenBSD, you're accepting Theo's leadership. That, that's just how it is. Uh, you know, and members like uh, you know, Bob Beck and Westerback help define standards for behavior. And, and FreeBSD right now with this code of conduct thing, it's uh, people assume everything is fine until it's not. What works when FreeBSD was 50 people and one person could read every mailing list message on every mailing list. Uh, doesn't work for a group of 400 people. Um, there, were, there were problems around that, but uh, around this code of conduct rollout, and yes, it could have been handled better, but really, civilized behavior is what's required for living in a civilization, and FreeBSD is now a civilization. 
because uh, that, that code of conduct isn't about imposing rules. It's, uh, it's conditions under which the leadership must act to maintain social norms. Again, the leadership defines the norms. I mean, you know, frankly, I enjoy smack talk. What, poor Benedict this morning. Now, you know, good people and Benedict, but frankly, you know, I've known Benedict for years, and, and he would have been affronted if I hadn't taken the time to handcraft an insult personally for him and offer it as a gift. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, some of you I just met yesterday, and I'm not going to try that with you. That, that's, you know, cultural norms and civilized behavior. But, really, and, and, and I, after all that exploration and, and, find, and rediscovering all the things that I love about the BSD community and, and refreshing that, you know, BSD is the royalty of Unix. We have our, our, our lords and nobles and dukes and earls and, and in all of this, I'm, I'm afraid I'm the court jester and I am here for life until one of the lords orders my head cut off. So, uh, all that is really why BSD. And, and we've got a couple moments, I think, for questions, just a couple. So, uh, I, I'm going to indulge my, my IRS responsibilities so I can deduct my meals, and I have a pile of stuff out there that you can buy. Um, and I'm running a charity auction uh, of special editions of a couple books for FreeBSD and OpenBSD. And last I checked, one of the auctions was going for more money than the other. So to the BSD whose auction is at a lower total, I say, are you going to let the other BSD get away with that? Come on, bid higher. Uh, so are there any questions? Rotten eggs. Insults, carefully handcrafted just for me. And there is a microphone, Alan, so if you're going to snark, please get up and use the microphone. Because you brought enough snark for everyone. I know you did. Come on, so, okay. Is anyone awake? No. no. <laughs> Okay, everybody up. On your feet, come on. Come on. Spread, there's lots of room, spread out just a little. Okay, move your arms around. Get some blood flowing. Okay, move at the waist. Okay. Now jump just a little, everybody. Come on. Okay, Kirk is following me and he's gonna expect Life, not zombies, you know. Don't come. Okay. Thank you all. Bid early, bid often. You got a standing ovation. <laughs>